Kia ora How are you doing? <laughs> You'll hear me ask that question a lot in the coming little while. By email, on these videos, by phone, by text. We do genuinely want to know how you are doing in this crazy season. And it is my prayer for you that things are starting to settle down for each of you just a little bit. That you're settling into a new routine, a new normal, a new way of connecting with each other. And I also hope and pray that you've had a chance over the last few days to process this past week and everything that has happened, to begin to process your grief. Because whether you realize it or not, whether you know it or not, each one of us will be experiencing grief because we've experienced loss in the last few days. The loss of routine, the loss of being able to be close to those we love who are not part of our household, the loss of events that we were looking forward to. For some of us, even the loss of a sense of safety and security that all is well with the world. I saw a meme on social media this week that said, I didn't plan on giving up quite so much for Lent. And while I chuckled a little bit, it also deeply resonated. I don't think any of us planned on giving up quite so much for Lent this year. That said, I hope you're also, like me, beginning to see some silver linings in all of this that you're beginning to see the opportunities that this season is presenting us with and beginning to see the ways that God is most definitely still at work. And believe it or not, not everything has to change. We've been working our way slowly through the book of Luke in the last several weeks as, as we preach through this book, this gospel of Luke, and we actually just continue with that today. Over the last month or so, we've journeyed through the first few chapters in Luke's gospel, and we've met along the way, we met baby John, Jesus' cousin. We met baby Jesus. We've spent some time with 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. We've tracked Jesus as he grew up, as he was baptized by John in the Jordan River, as he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And up till now in Luke's gospel, it's been about Jesus' internal life and his immediate world. Kind of like his family life and the events surrounding his birth and just his immediate world. I mean, his growth physically and spiritually. Up till now, it's been about Jesus and his relationship with his family and his relationship with the other two members of the Trinity. His, His Father, Father God, and the Holy Spirit. He's been learning and growing and developing in the knowledge of who he is, developing in the knowledge of his place in the Trinity and what he's about. He's learned and he's interpreted and he's understood scripture and he's used that scripture in the temptations, in the desert. He's known hunger and work. He's learned to trade. And he's been obedient and he's been baptized and basically he's just done a whole lot of growing up. Up till now, we've read about a young Jesus, a Jesus who's growing up, a Jesus who's learning who he is and what he's about. And our passage today, Luke chapter 4, 14 to 30, I encourage you to read it even if you need to pause this to have a little read through it. But our passage today begins with the words, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And this marks a transition in Jesus' life. I mean, this is Jesus ready. (laughs) This is Jesus all grown up. This is Jesus fully aware of who he is and what he's about. And people are beginning to notice. They're beginning to say good things about him. They're beginning to tell stories about when they've heard him teach. They're beginning to be impressed with his teaching. This is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. And right there, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus, all grown up, (laughs) he finds himself in his hometown. He no longer lives in Nazareth. 
but he's returned for a visit and he heads to the synagogue as was his custom. I love that. If you happen to be the son of God, I'm quite sure that your local synagogue was probably lacking in some way. But Jesus goes to the local synagogue as was his custom. And we know by the actions of those around him that he's either been invited to speak or at least he's been approved to speak in his local synagogue because he's handed the scroll to read. He's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Verse 16 says he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now hear me about this. Jesus didn't go and sit down back in his seat in the audience like we so often believe. We, we so often believe he just kind of cut his sermon short, read the scroll and sat back down again. It's not quite what happened. Jesus read the scroll and then sat down to teach. He stood to read the Holy Scriptures, as would probably be expected, but teachers in those days almost inevitably sat down to teach. And so here is Jesus reading the well-known words of the prophet, reading the text that everyone there would know refers to the coming Messiah, and he sits down to teach on this passage sits down to tell them what this passage means and how it's interpreted in this day and age, sits down to teach the scriptures. And his teaching is this. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Mic drop, right? I mean, you can almost hear the collective gasp and the sun, stunned silence. Today, this scripture, this messianic scripture, has been fulfilled in your hearing. This moment is worthy of all of the background music, dramatic background music that you've ever heard. I mean, Jesus does so many things in this moment that each is worth a sermon on its own. He he announces that he is the Messiah, and the Messiah is he. This is Jesus going public with his mission statement. He goes public about what his Messiahship is going to be about. It's going to be about bringing good news to the poor. It's going to be about setting the captives and the breast free. It's going to be about giving sight to the blind and declaring that the time is now. The kingdom is here. This is Jesus announcing that this isn't just his mission. He's been sent and anointed by the Holy Spirit for this task. This is Jesus shining a light on reality, committing himself to the real world rather than the squeaky clean world of the religious leaders. He commits himself to a world where he knows that people are being held captive by oppression and sin and brokenness. That people are truly blind to what God is doing and what he's up to in the world. This is Jesus announcing that brokenness and sin and captivity and blindness and oppression will not have the final words in his kingdom. And if all that wasn't mind-blowing enough, Luke continues. Verse 22, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, surely you who quote this proverb to me, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. 
and you will tell me do here in your hometown what you what we have heard you do in Cape Capena. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah, the prophet. Yet no one, not one of them was cleansed. Only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. And I don't want you to miss the significance of this moment. I mean, in that moment, as Jesus began to explain that this wasn't going to be the way they thought it would be. That he wasn't just going to meet their expectations all of the time. In that moment, the people only had two options available. They could reshape and remodel and remake their framework for who God is. Or they could dismiss this entire thing as rubbish and run Jesus out of time, try to kill him. It's like when you put a really big book on a really small bookshelf. It's too high to fit the shelf, so you try turning it sideways, and that just doesn't work because if you're anything like me, you've actually got bookshelves that are kind of like cubby holes, and it doesn't fit sideways either. And you sort of turn it on a diagonal, and you twist it and turn it and try and make it fit, but any which way you do it, that really big book just doesn't fit in the shelf. And in those moments, you have only two options. You can remodel the bookshelf. Or you can put the book somewhere else, away from the bookshelf, and not allow it to be part of your collection. Now, if the bookshelf is our understanding of who God is, if the bookshelf is our understanding of what the kingdom of God looks like, if the bookshelf is our framework for God's, Jesus' statement in Luke chapter 4 is the really big book. And for the religious leaders and the average person of the day, there was no way that that really big book was ever going to fit on their shelf. It wasn't going to fit as the framework for who God is. Their bookshelf, their frame, was all about rules and righteousness and holiness. And talk of compassion and freedom and justice and God not meeting expectations just didn't fit. And the reality is that if you created a frame based on only the first few chapters of the book of Luke, or if you created a frame for who God is based only on Sunday school, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, the baby in the manger with the angels and the shepherds. If you created your frame for who God is around that, then the reality is when you encounter an adult Jesus who arrives in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, who's ready for ministry, then there's no way that's going to fit in your frame. And you, like the people of Nazareth, will only have two options available to you. You can remodel your bookshelf, or you can throw the book away and ignore that part of who God is. You see, if your framework for who God is says that everyone gets healed, if you just have enough faith and you just pray enough, then the reality that sometimes faithful, godly, genuine people who you love get sick and die, despite all of our prayers to the contrary, that reality is going to leave you with a choice. You're either going to have to remodel your framework for who God is or give up on God. If your framework for God 
It says, only good things happen to good people. Then when disaster strikes, the very best person that you know, and let's face it, in our own minds, the very best person that we know is usually ourselves. Or when something crazy like a global pandemic starts to kill tens of thousands of people and leaves us all dealing with a month-long lockdown, then that reality is going to leave you either having to remodel your framework for who God is, or you're going to have to give up on that aspect of who God is, a God who is present in the middle of this, but still letting it happen. If your framework for God says you just need to give him money and, and you'll get riches in return, then when the reality of the bills piling up and people in this season losing their jobs and, you know, no apparent miraculous intervention happening, when that happens, you're either going to need to remodel your framework for who God is or you're going to have to give up on God altogether. Because the reality is that God just doesn't fit into our boxes. God doesn't fit into our bookshelves. God is bigger and more mysterious and more crazy and more radical and more awesome and more everything than fits into our little boxes that we create for him. And yes, that, that results in confusion sometimes. Yes, in the middle of a global pandemic, we go, what is going on, God? Yes, that results in a God that we don't always fully understand. But the reality is, we, like the people of Nazareth, are left with a choice to remodel our frame of who God is, that he's bigger and more independent than baby Jesus in the manger. Or we give up on huge aspects of who God is. And the thing is, we do this remodeling all the time in so much of our life. We actually do it in all areas of our life quite easily, but for some reason it's really, really hard to do this when it comes to our faith. When I was in primary school, uh, I think I've told you this before, most of you, but uh, I learned, like, like most of us, I learned about the water cycle. I learned about how the rain falls to the earth and then the sun comes out and evaporates up into the clouds and when those clouds get heavy, they rain. And the whole cycle begins again. Beautiful and succinct and true. But when you go to university and get a geography degree, as I did once upon a time, you find out that it's all true, but it's also woefully incomplete. When you're in primary school, you're told that it rains when the clouds get heavy. And they get much, much more water in them. But the reality is a big black menacing rain cloud is actually no heavier than a fluffy white cloud on a sunny, sunny summer's day because the water droplets never actually combine. They never actually get bigger, bigger, bigger and combine and get heavier. There's more of them, but they're no heavier. And you begin to realize when you're doing this at university level, that we actually have no idea what it is that makes clouds rain. I mean, we can make clouds. It's called cloud seeding. But we have no idea what makes them drop their water. And we can't make them do it. Sitting in a university lecture, lecture theater, I had to remodel my framework for how the water cycle works and what it is we know, and how much we don't know. We do this remodeling all the times in all sorts of areas of our lives. New information comes in about the best food to eat, and we change our diet even just slightly. New information comes out about uh, the best hygiene pro pr uh, practices in light of coronavirus, and we reframe what we knew. A relationship in our life changes for better or for worse, and we reframe how we interact with that person. And yet when it comes to faith, and when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to who Jesus is, 
It's actually a statistical fact. People have done research on this. It's a statistical fact that an awful lot of people are not prepared to touch that framework. And understandably so. Because we fear heresy. We fear being wrong. We fear change. Don't get me wrong. Like the people of Nazareth, we can usually stretch our frames a little bit. I mean, they could stretch their frames to include Jesus being a good teacher. Some of them could even stretch their frame enough to include him being a prophet. He could be impressive. But to be the Messiah, to accept this God who didn't heal here in Nazareth like he had in other places, to accept that he wasn't going to be a God we could control, to accept that he wasn't going to live up to their expectations, to accept that the kingdom of God was going to be really different to what they were expecting. That was a step too far. And so they prepared to stone him. They prepared to throw him off a cliff. That was the beginning of uh, stoning in those days. You threw them off the cliff. And if they survived the fall, you would pelt them with stones. The miracle that Jesus did in Nazareth was he escaped their wrath. He escaped their stoning. He walked through them. It was a miracle that they didn't even notice. And friends, I realize that we find ourselves in a framework shifting time. We find ourselves literally living in a season that will be written about in the history book. And I know, actually, that many of us are planning to get stuck into projects around the home over the next four weeks. We're going to use this opportunity in the ways that we can, and good on you. But maybe there's some time in the next little while. Some time and space for projects of the heart to get started. Maybe there's some time and space for us to sit down with God first and foremost and maybe over the phone with others and begin to remodel a little bit of our old and outdated I mean, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe, Maybe there's an aspect of God that you've really wrestled with over the years or discard it entirely because it just doesn't fit the frame that you created all those years ago and you've never been brave enough to rebuild the frame. What disappointment or discomfort or experience or statement of Jesus have you never been able to reconcile with your view of who God is? What about God? And the situation we find ourselves, are you not letting yourself dwell on? Because to do so would would force you to choose between rebuilding your frame or dismissing who God really is. I'm just wondering if in this season, is it time? That with help and with support and with prayer, because I don't recommend you do it alone. And with scripture as your foundation, that you took on the task of rebuilding your frame. Is it time that you allowed God to be God, even in this crazy season of a pandemic? And stop trying to shove him into your too small book. Is it time we moved on? With Luke, from baby Jesus in the manger, miraculous and amazing as it was, to adult Jesus, full of the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit, God himself. I encourage you to wrestle with these things. I'm not giving you any answers today. I'm giving you the opportunity to wrestle. I'm giving you the opportunity to journey through Luke, to read ahead. To figure out who this Jesus really is and what he's up to in your life, even today. I encourage you as you figure out what your what the next little while looks like for you in terms of home projects and in terms of looking after your kids and in terms of all the things that you're doing. I encourage you in this crazy season to also spend some time with God, asking him to reveal who he is to you. 
As always, we're here to pray for you. I know I can't do that right after the sermon today, but uh, if you'd like to ring me, if you'd like to text me, email me, email one of our servant leaders, the people in the church, we'd love to pray with you and for you as we together wrestle in this season of what it means for who God is and how we relate to a God that we can't control, how we relate to a God that we can't dictate to, how we relate to a God who is still at work, even if not in all of the ways that we expect him to. I'm praying for you. I love you. Let's journey through this season together.